Today my desire is not necessarily to share something that's more of a practical how to do a service, how to preach a sermon, but to really give a blueprint of the church in the last days and more to bring a prophetic message and an encouragement message toward the pastors, leaders and those of you who are in church. If you're visiting tonight and you are not in church since the COVID and you found you and a Facebook prophet and a YouTube deliverance minister and you're like that's who really I need, I don't need the local church. I want you to reconsider and to realize that God does not want homeless Christians who don't have a home. Amen. You know deliverance ministry is supposed to make demons homeless not Christians. Unfortunately a lot of supernatural ministry has made a lot of Christians to become more dependent online. Nothing wrong. I love the online ministry and I have of it, I have of it myself, but the Lord wants us to be planted and grounded in the local church. You know, if you remove an organ out of my body and um, you place that organ in five years in a bucket for five years, that organ will deteriorate and die. But if my body will recover, please understand the church can exist and will exist without you. You cannot exist and be without the local church. God created the church for our good but without it, without it we don't survive but the church will. You know if I leave the local church I won't make it. The church will make it because the church is bigger than me but we all need the local church. Can somebody say amen? The church is the body of Christ, the church is the building of Christ and the church is also something that Jesus is currently building. It is His bride. Amen. And the Lord doesn't want us to be organs in the bank. He wants us to be organs in the body. A lot of us are organs in the bank. We're like, I just belong in the kingdom of God. But the Bible says that we're part of the body. We're not organs in the bank. We're organs in the body. That means we need to function in the body. We need to get um, changed because when we rub shoulders with other believers you know our issues get exposed our demons don't like their demons so we need to get delivered sanctified and renewed in our mind broken and that is how we become sanctified believers can somebody say amen I want to take the story today of Samson. If you have your Bible with me, I'm going to just going to highlight a few verses from his story, but go through the Samson story in sharing about the church in the last days. Judges chapter 16 and verse 26. We want to welcome everyone watching us online on YouTube and Facebook and whatever you're watching. Let us know where you're watching from. Drop that in the chat. Also share this broadcast with somebody. Click like, subscribe and share this on every platform that you have in Jesus name. So 16 and verse 26, then Samson said to the lad who held him by his hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women and all the lords of the Philistines were there. About 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. And Samson prayed to the Lord saying, O Lord God remember me, I pray strengthen me, I pray just this once, O God that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines and he pushed with all his might and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. And the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. The story of Judges, Judges has this cycles of God's people following God. They're prosperous and then they compromise and then they lose their freedom and then they get bound. Then they cry out and God sends the deliverer. They get delivered. They get comfortable. They get complacent and the cycle repeats until Samson. Interestingly with Samson, we don't see Israel crying out. With all other deliverers, most of them we see suffering, we see pain and we see a cry going out to God and God sends a deliverer as an answer to the cry of his people. In the story of Samson, we see almost we see the bondage, we see the Philistines tormenting God's people but we don't see a cry of God's people. Now maybe there was something going on but what I want to highlight 
today is that Samson came as an answer to a prayer nobody prayed. No wonder he was the Lone Ranger. No wonder he wasn't embraced by the people he was sent to help because they never prayed for it. I want to encourage every one of us today. The reason why we need to be a praying church is because when God sends revival so we can embrace the revival we need. Many times prayer prepares us as much as it prepares something for us. When we live a prayerless, when we become prayerless as a church, God will still in His mercy and in His sovereignty send His move, send His grace, send Samson's deliverers, men and women of God, movements our way. Many of us will find ourselves criticizing instead of embracing that because prayer prepares you for that which God has prepared for you. I want to challenge you today that we as a church become a praying church. Maybe you're not seeing revival in your church. People aren't getting saved. Do not get disappointed. Become a praying church. Take responsibility for the prayer in your church. Turn the church into a house of prayer before it becomes a house of all nations. I remember a long time, a long time ago when the Lord you know, put on my heart this verse that my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. When we didn't see people coming and getting saved for a decade when I was in the youth ministry. And we've tried everything in the book. And I brought sermon illustrations on the stage. I mean, I brought a pig, a sheep, a motorcycle, a casket. I mean, I've done illustrative sermons that make Ed Young look like he doesn't know what he's doing. And the church, the youth group did not grow. I preached, I mean, the sweat came out and we believed in healing. We believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so, and just seemed like there was like a spiritual barrier in that. And I got really disappointed. I said, Lord, you called our church to be a church of nations. You called our church to reach the world. Why is it not happening? Why is nobody coming? And when we started to dedicate to prayer and fasting, Something started to happen. There are spiritual forces that are at play and are at war against the church progressing and advancing. You must understand this is not just about parking lot ministry, coffee shop, and a kids ministry check-in. It's not just about planting center and a social media platform. What we're doing is not a boys and girls club. We are rescuing people from eternal damnation. There will be resistance in the realm of the spirit, but prayer paralyzes that resistance. Fasting paralyzes that, that resistance. And you might not have a degree, and you might not have an advantage, Advantage, but when you get on your knees, you have all the advantage you need to cripple things in the realm of the Spirit and to have a victory in Jesus' name. The Bible says in the last days, you know, the Scripture says, not in the last days, but in the book of Chronicles, it says that when I shut down heaven, when there is no more rain, when there is no revival, God gave us a recipe and that is not protesting, it's praying. And that is not a shift in the White House. It is a shift in my house. It is a shift in your house. And God didn't say if the educated. God didn't say if the doctors and the lawyers. God says if my people. That means that God says we can shift things in the realm of the Spirit by something that every Christian had for the last 2,000 years. It's called getting on your knees. It's called when you have nothing else. You've tried everything that you can. But there is something you can do. You may not speak the language, you may not understand the culture, and you might not have the tools that other churches have, but if you have your knees and they can bend, you have all the tools you need right now. And that is begin to pray. If revival hits your church and your church is not prepared through prayer, you will reject that revival. You won't embrace the revival. You will do with that revival what Israel did with Samson thought it was weird, thought it was wild, it doesn't belong here. They sold him. They got rid of him. Why? Because anytime God gives something to a prayerless generation, they don't know what to do with it. We must embrace a lifestyle of prayer. Unfortunately, churches today, they don't pray, they stray. Unfortunately today, instead of having saints that live a life of supplication, we have saints that sip. Mm-hmm. They drink. Not the Holy Spirit, but other stuff. 
and a lot of us who bought into greasy grace where anything is possible and you can do whatever you want and once saved always saved you just simply there's nothing you can do and pastors and leaders this this is what I've noticed my personal conviction and I'm preaching in such a way that I don't get invited again so just FYI the more alcohol runs among the leadership the less prayer runs in church the Bible says do not be drunk with wine but be filled with the Holy Spirit and we can fight till tomorrow morning about drinking and all this stuff but one thing I know is the devil will use alcohol as a substitute for a spirit-filled life we are spirit-filled Pentecostals we need to come back to praying in the Holy Ghost we need to come back to fasting we need to come back to holiness we need to come back to sanctification and dedication that we don't have to fight for our right to drink alcohol because we're so filled with the Holy Spirit we have prayer meetings we go to a fast why because we know the power of the Holy Spirit Call me legalist, call me he's far right, whatever you want and I'll be okay with it. But one thing I'm not okay with is when there is no prayer in church. When there is no prayer in church. God didn't give the secret to revival as a Facebook marketing strategy. Instagram marketing is not a secret sauce for a revival in the church. Yes, it could give me more followers but it cannot deliver somebody from a demon. Yes, having more subscribers on YouTube can give me an exposure and more people can come to church, but it cannot help a transgender to be converted. Only the power of Jesus. And that power comes when we get on our knees. And that power comes, mom and dad, when you stop praying for your son. I know you lectured him. I know you've told him what he's doing is wrong, but you still have one more weapon in your arsenal. They can stop a drug addict in his tracks. They can bring an homosexual son and a lesbian daughter back home. It is called your prayer and your fasting. And if you are praying and you are fasting, I want to encourage you to keep on praying. Keep on fasting why because your prayer is heard in heaven and to your prayer there's an answer amen Samson came as an answer to a prayer Israel seems like did not pray God wants us to be a praying congregation and a praying church because it prepares us for revival and it prepares revival for us if you have your notes I'm gonna give you today a sermon model that our professor will say is not a good idea. I'm going to give you 10 points. And I'm going to be as one of the examples in his class in the future of what not to do. <laughs> and I rarely do that, professor, but today it will be that exception. Samson and the church. The first thing that I want you to write down if you're taking notes, and that is Samson was anointed and the church was anointed or born at Pentecost. Samson was anointed by the Holy Spirit. The church, we see the church was born at Pentecost. May we never forget our birthday Pentecostals. And our birthday is the day of Pentecost. Some of us have became practicing continuationists. And some of us have become just believing continuationists. And there are some in here, you are soft core cessationists, meaning you believe that the power of God ended with the disciples, but every once in a while, somewhere in the jungles of Tanzania, God will heal some widow just to show his glory. And so you can have a story in your book. But God doesn't do that today. We cannot believe for God to heal today. We do not believe that God can deliver people today. And many Christians today for the fear of what the world will think of us have embraced even Pentecostals who simply glorified the old good days but no longer pursue the power of God today. Samson was anointed. I do believe that God anoints people. He doesn't necessarily use them. We like the phrase God uses us but I'm yet to find one reference in the Bible where the Bible says God uses people. The Bible says God fills people, God leads people, the Bible says God anoints people. You will not find a reference where God uses people. Why? Because whatever you use you usually discard. 
Whatever you use, usually not valuable. I use napkins, I use a plate, I use a car. Those things don't have a lot of value. And I want to tell you something, God doesn't necessarily use people in a sense that we are a means to an end. God anoints us. God works with us. The Bible says the Lord working with them, confirming their word with signs and wonders. We are not a means to an end for God. We are not just project in God's arsenals. We're not just numbers on a spreadsheet. We are His children. We are His sons and we are His daughters and He wants to anoint us. The way He anointed Samson, what made Samson distinct wasn't his muscles because if it would be muscles, Delilah wouldn't ask what is the secret of your strength. The fact that, that she was asking what is the secret of your strength means He was ordinary on the outside but everything was different in the realm of the spirit and you and I can be ordinary you can be a refugee you can be an immigrant you can be white black you can be educated or maybe a high school dropout when the anointing of God touches your life it makes a difference in your life the interesting part is the anointing of God does not wait for your bachelor's or your master's degree it waits for your willingness it waits for your surrender it waits for you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues and the power of God begins to fall upon your life. We need more anointing, more than degrees. And I, I am in the school myself right now. I have my own online school. I believe in Christian education. But none of that can come in comparison with the power of the Holy Spirit upon the life of a minister. And we young ministers, we need that more than ever. You need anointing more than to be verified on Instagram. You need anointing more than a building, a budget, or a staff. We need God's anointing. God's anointing is what makes all the difference. God doesn't use me. He anoints me. God wants to anoint you. Whether you are doing kids ministry, whether you are usher at your church and you're doing camera work, God's anointing is for every task in His kingdom. Can somebody say amen? The second thing I want you to notice is that Samson, not only he was anointed, but he went against the gates. The church was called to stand against the gates of hell and the gates will not prevail. Matthew 16, 18 it says, So I say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Samson went against the gates, took the gates off of its hinges and just took them off and went through those gates. I believe that the Lord has called the church and we see the early church, the church of apostles, the church of early church fathers and I believe that's the church God wants to see today is the church that will be confrontational against the forces of darkness. That means that we're not here to play games. That means we are not here to cater to culture. We are here to stand against demonic agenda. See some of us think some churches got soft. Jesus says on this rock I will build the church and he did not say they will have an unprofit status. He said they will have a position right by the gates of hell. They will resist gates of hell. We as spirit-filled believers, one of the first things that begins to happen when you walk in the anointing of God is you will be a trouble for the demonic. What is the first thing that happened when Jesus came back from the wilderness after temptation? Demons started to manifest in a synagogue. This was not a nightclub. This was not some kind of other meeting. This was in the place where the anointing comes. It provokes the demonic. We live in a culture today where the demonic is domesticated. We live in a culture today where TikTok has become the devil's sewer pipeline for the young people to embrace sorcery, witchcraft on a scale this was unthinkable for two generations ago or even generation ago. Where Ouija boards, we're consulting the dead, we're necromancy, we're bringing crystals for healing, we're having breathing exercises where you scream out your anger and where you practice yoga and when you channel the spirits, when that has become so popular in our culture, it's funneled through our movies, it's funneled through our games, it's funneled today to our culture and our culture drinks it like water. Why? Because we were wired for an invisible encounter with a spiritual being. We were made in the image and likeness of God. There is a craving inside of every human being to connect with supernatural. And the devil knows that and he counterfeits the supernatural by offering what I call toilet water. It has bacteria. 
He offers new age. He offers witchcraft and he offers a cult. Where maybe 50 years ago in the United States of America, the idea of the church confronting demonic was, oh, this is just weird. You don't want to be those weird people. It will become a necessary and an essential thing in the next season. Because the teenagers that will be coming to our churches are not just going to be dealing with atheism. They're going to be dealing with spirits. And those spirits will need to be not consult, not medicated, but cast out. I still believe in casting out of demons. I still believe in healing the sick. Nothing wrong with medicine, nothing wrong with doctors, nothing wrong with therapy and counseling. But my Bible tells me that God anointed Jesus who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. The church has to take its rightful position as the early church this, did. To be an army, not an audience. To build soldiers, not snowflakes. To engage in warfare not just engage in online arguing. For us to become a place where the captives can be set free. For us to be the place that if city knows that if you have a demonized daughter, there is a place. They're weird, but they get stuff done. They might be crazy. They'll call you weird until their child needs deliverance. They'll call you crazy until their child went through every psycho, psychotherapy or any other stuff and they cannot get any help. And then breakthrough begins to come. Amen. Wild church. Third thing I want you to notice, not only Samson removed the gates and he was anointed. Number three is Samson sent foxes to the fields. The early church would send missionaries. Philip, Luke, Paul would go to the fields and burn the enemy's work through the preaching of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 it says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. I want you to notice that Samson would gather 300 foxes and he would pair them by twos and he would put fire in their tails and send them, not on a vacation, he would send them on a little errand into the Philistines fields. And everywhere the foxes went, the fire followed and it did damage. And it burned the works of Philistines. The church is called to do exactly the same. To raise foxes, and that's young people. They're not easy to catch. And definitely not easy to pair. <laughs> and to put fire in them. That means take them to a summer camp. Take them to a youth conference. Let them have an encounter with God and then let them go to Bible school so that encounter can be, so they can be explained, so they can know what they believe in. But if they only know about God but they don't know Him personally, see the Bible says taste and see. The Bible doesn't say study and know. We need to study but we also need to experience. Young people need to experience the presence of God. We need to bring experiential part of the gospel back to the church. As the professor mentioned in the morning, the people feel the presence of God. The people encounter the presence of God. And when they feel that fire, then to release them into schools. Release them into universities. Release them into the world. Why? Because the church is not a destination. A church is a gas station. We don't come to it. We come out of it. It, when you get dressed, you don't get dressed to go to the gas station. If you ever go to a gas station, it's really because you're going through a gas station. When we made the church as a destination and we cause everybody to bring their fire here and we build a big fireplace, that is not the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to kindle the flame in your tail, meaning to put the flame in your heart and in your soul so that you leave the church into your workplace, workplace, marketplace, and you begin to burn the works of the enemy by preaching the good news, living the good news, and impacting your world for the cause of Christ. Can somebody say amen? I want you to notice number four is Samson killed with the jawbone of a donkey. The church won the world with the preaching of the gospel with their mouth. The church, early church, we're talking still about the early church. We're going to come back to, come back to us in just a moment. The early church conquered the world not by its social media, email marketing, or any other methods mainly. Methods they changed but what really really sparked the revival and the defeat 
of the work of the enemy in the first 200 300 years was the preaching of the gospel and the practicing of the good works the power of God our advantage in our generation is the preaching of the gospel which I want to challenge every pastor not to shy away from preaching the full gospel not to shy away from preaching things that make people uncomfortable many of us sometimes out of fear we say well I don't want to talk about that I don't want to address the topic of homosexuality and if we do we make this weird apologies like we don't know why God did it we just we don't even agree with it but we just feel so bad because we kind of serve him we signed up for that and we make it seem like God is stupid and we're stupid for obeying him and we want you to be stupid because we're stupid because we don't know why God did it and we apologize for God and there are things we don't understand in the scriptures I get that but when it comes to basic design of how God made male and female basic design where God says a marriage is between a man and a woman and this is not being phobic of anything we have to stand and defend the scripture but cancer culture will cancel you it's better to be canceled than crucified one day they might crucify us but we're gonna still have to preach the truth preach the truth in love it's through the preaching of the gospel that we conquer the nations it's through preaching of God's word that we conquer the nations and today unfortunately we tickle people's ears today a lot of times what we do is we're like man I want to preach the series that draws them in we don't want to talk about the supernatural I don't want to talk about healing which people are gonna think we're one of those weird ones we definitely don't ever want to mention tongues why because they'll think we're the weird ones but how will we destroy the arguments in the minds of people except by preaching of the gospel I am not ashamed of the message of the cross it is death to those that are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God I've been saved by that message I've been sanctified by that message I've been delivered from pornography by that message I've been delivered from nightmares by that message and therefore today when we are ashamed of something that set us free shame on us our advantage is the preaching of the gospel because unlike preaching morality our gospel has power because it has the spirit behind it but the word of God is living and powerful it's sharper than any other sword it's not an outdated book it's not a boring book preachers are boring the Bible is not boring but when you are filled with the Holy Ghost and you are bold and you are unashamed and you're not judgmental and you're not hateful but you're loving but you preach the gospel you set the captives free I remember I released a video about homosexuality uh, a month ago and a young man watched it who actually went to church and commented on the video and said this convicted me and I was pretty straightforward but very kind because homosexuals are people and they're sinners just like every category of sinners that Jesus died for and so we're called to rescue people not to condemn people sin is what's going to condemn it but I said exactly what the scripture teaches and I called people to repentance and I said if you are a homosexual and you call yourself a Christian you are deceived and you need to repent because you cannot identify with your sexuality you identify with Christ and one one man commented and he says I am a practicing married homosexual who is going to church he says me and my husband are watching this video we both got convicted that it's an abomination and he says we're getting divorced tomorrow and the next day they got divorced preaching of the gospel destroys demonic arguments preaching of the truth you may say it's not popular a lot of things are not popular but we believe in the power not in popularity things that are popular they come and they go but the power of the gospel will change people's lives and when we are not ashamed when we are not afraid to preach the good news when the apostles preached the Pharisees looked at them and they said they were bold because they've been with Jesus we got a lot of spineless preachers today a lot of weak preachers today a lot of preachers who make apologies who are not bold but too balanced so balanced they don't know what they believe in so calculated they lost their spine they lost their courage they lost their conviction and people are unsure what they believe and they come and they go to church for years and they don't know what we believe and it doesn't change their life because the bible says go and make disciples teaching them not just simply hiding the truth we got to proclaim the truth because that jaw of a donkey is our weapon to defeat the plan of the enemy
I love it. A less and less claps. Okay, we're going. I'm only on point four. Let's go to number five. Are you still with me? Samson compromised and lost his anointing. Samson compromised and lost his anointing. When he compromised first time, he didn't lose it right away. It's the continuous compromises. He lost his anointing. The early church, when Constantine, when the emperor converted to Christianity, and there's a lot of different stories about how his conversion wasn't genuine. He also lived a moral life and etc. I won't touch that right now. What I want to mention on is that if you look at the history of the early church, ever since Christianity became state religion and it became popular to become a pastor, a priest, people started to become pastors not because they had a call but because they wanted a career. Let me say that again. People became pastors not because they had a call but because it was a lucrative career. The power of God was no longer necessary to propagate the gospel. Now we had the law and the army on our side. Now we could enforce our laws and our morality on everyone else without the help of the Holy Spirit and the need of the supernatural. And while it was a great day for the church that we were no longer slaughtered and destroyed and eaten by lions, it was also a sad day because that's when the Bible was taken away from the average believer. When the priests, the pastors who became pastors, some of them were not even converted. But it was a popular thing to do. It was a career choice you can choose. It wasn't a calling that God chooses you in and you feel the unction of the Holy Spirit. There was a, there was a perks that was involved in it. And slowly but surely, compromise started to come in. Sins of people were no longer pardoned by the blood. They were pardoned by the priest. Now you can pay to get somebody out of purgatory. Doctrines that are not found in the New Testament started to populate the pulpit to justify behaviors that are not scriptural. And the church of Jesus Christ generally, we're not talking about the remnant, but generally started to compromise. And the first thing that went is the anointing of God. The presence of God was gone. We still had cathedrals. We still had a Bible. We still had people proclaiming. People had wars in the name of God. Christianity was quote-unquote spreading but God's presence was not on it. And it's possible as a church to be paid off, to have a paid off building, to have a budget, to have success and lose the precious anointing. Lose that unction. Lose that awe of God when people walk and they come to church and conviction hits people. And the presence of God comes upon people during worship and tears begin to roll their eyes. Where it's not just another song. Where it's not just something that everyone is aware. Well, we, we know where this is going to go. Pastor's going to say this. I'm looking at my clock. He's never one minute more and not one minute less. I know everything is super organized and I love organization. I love the importance of management. But please understand, we have the Holy Spirit who created the heavens and created the earth and he is a wild goose like one author said. Holy Spirit is a mighty, mighty Spirit of God and when we lose the precious anointing, one thing that we don't lose with the anointing is our titles, our positions. And I believe when you continue to do the ministry and you lose the anointing, your ministry will bury you. King Saul lost the anointing when did he die? What kind of battle was he involved in? He was anointed to, to fight Philistines. Guess where he died? In the battle with Philistines. Samson was anointed to defeat Philistines. In which battle did he die in? With Philistines. Without the anointing, you will continue your calling. It will be your funeral, your graveyard. Without the anointing, the calling of God is dangerous. With the anointing, you're dangerous. Anointing of God is this precious, precious empowerment and we have to guard it with everything. And we may compromise there and there, shy away there and be afraid there and be afraid there and God will still be merciful. Not because God is condoning our behavior but because God is kind and God is giving us a chance to repent. But the moment we take the mercy of God as a sign that God is okay with my behavior, 
Very soon it will be what happened to Samson. God will lift the anointing. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not talking about your place in heaven right now. I'm talking about the precious anointing of the Holy Spirit that gives us that life, that gives us that fire for the ministry, that lets us step into places where witches and warlocks cast spells and you sleep like a baby at night that lets us walk through the fire and not get burned lets us walk through the valley and not get stuck in there it's the precious anointing of the Holy Spirit when you lose it sometimes you are not aware it's gone that's one thing about the anointing it comes loud it leaves quiet when it comes it zaps you like fire you fall on the floor, you speak in tongues, you see visions. When it comes, it comes and you feel electrifying presence of God in your physical body. But when it leaves, it usually leaves no notice. Until the next time you say, I will do it again what I did before. But it doesn't work. It's not the same. Everyone knows. And you begin to feel, I lost it. I had it. I lost it. I don't know where, but I lost it. And guess what happens next? When the church lost its anointing, I want you to go to number six. Are you still with me? Number six, Samson was bound, blind, and went in circles. And the church, number six, during the dark ages, lost its vision of Jesus, lost its purpose, and lost its freedom. It was no longer a vehicle of God to the world. The church we're speaking, of course, I'm speaking of the Catholic Church right now. And those of you who are Catholics here, I love you. God loves you. But a lot of stuff in Catholicism is wrong. The church went bald, shaved, lost its hair, blind and bound. And I want you to notice what happened. The Bible says that Samson was going in circles. This is what happens every time we lose anointing. And when not, a lot of times, there's nothing wrong if for a season we are stuck in a season and all of this stuff. I'm not saying every person here to feel like, okay, I lost the anointing because I'm going in circles. But if you notice you're going in circles and you also don't have a vision, you lost the vision. And if at the time you notice that there is a life of compromise and all of your spiritual disciplines are out of the window, I want to honestly speak to you right now have you lived your life in such a way where you didn't treasure the precious anointing of God because the compromises of today do not bring calamities today they bring calamities tomorrow and the sacrifices of today do not bring miracles today they bring miracles tomorrow Joshua said to the people he says sanctify yourselves today for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders. That means today's sacrifice is tomorrow's miracles. And today's compromise is tomorrow's chains. Today's complacency is tomorrow's problems. Today's slipping, tripping, today's lying, cutting corners, today's not praying, not fasting, today living like this for a while is going to bring that stuff tomorrow. You can still walk in that power today. You can still walk in that power for a month, for two, for a year. But sooner or later, unless a man repents and turns back to his first love, that grace begins to lift. That anointing begins to lift. But because we're employed by the church, because we, we, we've never done a lot of times any other job, what happens is we continue to go through the motion. And now this calling that brought us joy is grinding us. It's grinding. And on the top of that, we're dealing with personal problems. On the top of that, the devil assaults us with power from the supernatural realm. And we're fighting spiritual, physical, natural. And there is no grace. It's the most dangerous place to be. I would rather be in the middle of war with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Criticized by every human being on the planet. And to be on the top of the mountain and being the most popular person without this precious anointing. Because this anointing will maintain you. It gives you that cover. It gives you the protection against the demonic, against the retaliation of the spiritual realm. And it gives you this, this closeness to God, knowing that you're walking pleasing to Him. You're walking being in honor of Him. And He protects you. 
And even if you feel stuck, you know it's not for a long time. He's going to take you out of that place. If you are a leader, if you are a pastor and you are here today and you feel that your spiritual life has got turned into circle, blind, no sense of vision, you only live by the victories of the past, you don't have a clear picture of the future and maybe that precious anointing, you lost that and now you criticize others who move in that partially why? It's because deep on inside you're jealous of the days you used to have. And you're seeing somebody who's bold but reckless but you used to be like that and now you became balanced and now you became so calculated that you don't see any supernatural you don't see any miracles i want to challenge you not to foolishness not to weirdness but i want to challenge you today to come back to your first love i want to challenge you today to begin to spend time with jesus so that your critics will say they've been with jesus we can say we don't like them, we disagree with them, but we can say nothing because the person that got healed, there's nothing we can say against that. And no, we know that they're not educated as we are, but something about them that you cannot stop or kill because it's the precious anointing of God. Amen. Are you with me? Number seven, Samson's hair started to grow back. God started to restore the church and the message of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. It started in 1917. It definitely started earlier but 1917 with the Reformation movement when Martin Luther stapled those theses to the Catholic Church. What started to happen in the spirit realm I believe prophetically is the hair, the remnants started to rise up. Even with Samson when he was going in circles the Bible says and the hair started to grow back. When a reformation movement came and we renounced and broke away from salvation through works but salvation by grace through faith, the hair started to grow back. And then when the Azusa Street revival came, when the Kansas outpouring came, the hair started to grow that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then when the worship movement came and then when the healing came and then when the deliverance came, God started to restore to the church the fullness of what He wants the church to be. I want to challenge every person here today, if you lost the anointing, you can get it back. If you lost your edge in ministry, you can get it back. If your well got filled with dirt, you can dig the well again and get the water again. If in your church you lost the holy reverence and awe for God and there is no momentum and you say, you know what, I'm going to close the church, I am done. Listen, hold on, hold on because our God is the God of restoration. He is the God that restores. He is the God that renews. And He can give you your passion back. He can give you your freedom back. He can give you that grace back. He can restore your years that the locust has devoured. Hallelujah. In Genesis 26, 18, it says, And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. I believe a lot of us in here today, especially those of you who are from a Slavic background, you stand on the shoulders of your father Abraham, who dug wells during former Soviet Union, who started churches. Many of you are standing on the shoulders of your dad and your grandpa, who did things for God, who saw healing, saw deliverances and saw the move of God. And today you are standing and the devil has covered our wells with dirt, material things. He's covered our wells of revival with programs. And nothing wrong with dirt as long as it doesn't clog up the well. The dirt has its place but the well has to have released water because when the well gives water people can drink from it and the Bible says that out of you will flow the rivers of living water. You are not a bottle, you are a well and God wants to restore the flow of His precious anointing in your life. God wants to restore the flow of sacredness and passion for His presence. God wants to restore the holy awe that maybe you lost that you had before, that first love that maybe you had before. God wants your hair to grow back. Don't, don't, don't quit the ministry. Quit the sin. 
Quit the disappointment. Quit the complacency. Quit being offended at people that left you and get back to your secret place and say, God, do it again. God, revive me again. God, spark me again. God, break the tears in my eyes again. Break the fallow ground in my heart again. God, I want to see altars filled again. God, I want to see people healed again. God, I want to see people delivered again. God, I want to see people being excited about Jesus again. He wants to do it again. Amen. Number eight. Samson was led by a lad, a child, to his greatest victory. Samson was, a le was led by a child to his greatest victory. I believe the church is coming to a time, camera people, I apologize in advance. Church is coming to a time where the church of Jesus Christ is going to be joined with the lads, the youth, the teenagers. The last day, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on your, not your grandpas first, but your sons and your daughters. That's why the devil is pushing hormonal medicine on the teenagers, mutilation on the teenagers. If he couldn't kill them in the womb, he wants to kill them right when they're being confused in that age. Why? Because that demonic agenda is released against the lads of our generation. But my Bible makes me to understand that God has a plan for our families. Your children possess the gates of your enemies, the Bible says. That means that me and my house will serve the Lord. Moses made it clear to Pharaoh, we're not leaving Egypt without our little ones and without our wives and our possessions. Our kids do not belong to the demonic agenda of our culture. The church will unite the youth and together not fight each other, but go together to its greatest revival that we will see in our churches. Somebody give God some praise. I want to encourage every pastor, I want to encourage every youth pastor, God has a plan for teenagers in the last days. God has a plan for children in the last days. That's why we got a plan to start private schools. That's why we got to start dreaming that we're going to educate our children. The world is not going to indoctrinate. The TikTok is not going to disciple our generation. We will disciple our children. We will disciple our teenagers. We will raise them in the local church, teaching them the Bible. Then they will join the church. The days of youth fighting the adults are over. The days of youth undermining the adults are over. The Bible says that the lad took the hand of Samson and together they went to those two pillars. Every teenager, God wants to quicken you to join the hands with the adults in your church, to join the hands with your pastor, to join the hands with your parents, and to go together into the future of the church. And the future of the church is not a rainbow. The future of the church is revival. If we, if we as the church ignore young generation we will not have revival we will be a retirement retirement centers majority of churches today in the united states what happened in uk in london in those places churches became retirement centers a lot of times because they did not focus on the youth until it was too late we have to invest in the youth and the teenagers not only in our prayers but involving them, platforming them, empowering them, and not have them hide behind us. Have them join hands with us and say, you are not the future, you are the present. Because you're in the middle school now. I'm not in the middle school. And I don't need you to be in the middle school in the future. You need to be in the middle school now. Which means that together we are with you right now. Together we are touching the high schools. Together we are touching the middle schools. Before the Second World War in Korea, the number of Christians in South Korea was about 3%. After the war, revival sparked in Korea. I mean, largest churches in the world were in Korea. 
it hit to about 34 percent of South Koreans were professing Christians which is 34 percent that that's you're talking about reformation the millennials now the teenagers in Korea who believe in Jesus now are three percent it's worse than before the war you go to the largest churches most of the largest churches including the Pentecostal ones and you will see barely any young people even to the God bless uh, the uh, Dr. David Tian Cho, the largest church if you go to the church today it's very there's no young people the last days God wants to bring young people to church but church God wants the church to join young people and together go into the next movement God wants to raise young generation my pastor did that with me when I was 13 he told me God called me to preach before God told me I'm called to preach I had no option my pastor platformed me and that's I, I use that word again platformed me before I was ready it offended older people older people didn't join our church they're like what is this kids club doing on the stage and I remember when Slavic families would come to our church and they're like we like the fact that you have kids presentation every Sunday pastor that's not kids presentation that's my worship team he says but every Sunday kids presentation he says when are we going to get spiritually fed and pastor would say this he says I'm not growing the church he says I'm growing people who one day will grow the church he waited 10 years every Sunday the church did not grow it shrunk pastor didn't care because we grew when I was 16 and I was just getting out of high school and I was about to apply for another job and he puts me on a full-time staff in the church I was like what do I do as a staff member he said figure it out and my pastor was not on the staff he had a business and he put me on the staff and he says you do, you're not gonna work and he's my older uncle and so I have no option I can't, I can't say no because he, he knows where I live and my mom is his younger sister trapped and then at 16 God spoke to me and called me because your uncle your pastor can get you so far but then God has to pick up and when the Holy Spirit touched me in my office on Wednesday at 12 o'clock when I was a senior in high school and he marked me and then what pastors been sowing those seeds they started to sprout and then I caught that vision and I started to burn with that vision and this missionary heart that my pastor had why he left Ukraine and to Russia to start churches in Russia it started to engulf my soul I started to burn for souls but things were not growing things were not happening now I know why because slow growth causes growth in your character and fast growth causes growth in your pride and so God had to go take me through all of this stuff and I remember when the breakthrough happened with the youth and the youth exploded there was four times more youth on youth night than people on Sunday morning and I got so excited about the revival in the youth and I had this brilliant idea to cancel Sunday morning church so I came to my pastor and I said pastor we know that this is a funeral this, nobody's coming here I only come because I love you and honor you and my parents come because they love you and honor you you know we can do so much better if we can sleep in on Sunday we already have church on Wednesday people are getting saved there demons are being cast out people are being healed cell groups are being started amazing things are happening let's cancel Sunday morning see that's what happens when you don't go to Bible college <laughs> you have crazy ideas and my pastor said no he said but you starting this week are transitioning from the youth to Sunday morning and I said, why is the punishment so severe? I thought I will work my way out of leading a church. And he says, you're going to have to let go of the youth and take on Sunday morning. And I really, for a lot of youth pastors, being a lead pastor is a promotion for me. It was a punishment. I literally felt like because Sunday morning, everything has to be official. Kids check in. Membership. There's membership. No, we don't have membership. We don't have a board. We have to have a board. Everything is so official. With the youth, it's easy. You scream, yell, bring pizza. Everybody's free. Everybody's touched. And we go back home. Everybody's happy. <laughs> Any youth pastors in this room, I just gave you secret sauce to get finished. I'm just kidding. And I remember at the age of 30 is when I transitioned to the lead church. This is not the painful part. The painful part is the second thing is when pastor told me he says do to them 
what I did to you. I said, who them? He said, them, the ones you don't like. I'm like, what, the 15-year-old demon-possessed teenagers in our church that I call cousins, my cousins? I was like, there is no way in this God's earth I will entrust them with anything, at least until they grow to 50. And I remember my pastor, he looks at me and he said, you were worse. I said, pastor, that's, you can't say that. It's an insult. He said, I trusted you. He says, I believed in you. He says, you have two jobs, lad. One is to lead Sunday morning and the other one is to have a next generation right behind you, right now, that are made up of 15 year olds. And he says, this youth ministry that you're leaving, he says, we're leaving it in the hands of teenagers. And we passed it on to teenagers. Our teenagers were so amazing. They grew the youth ministry from 300 to 30 quickly. The fastest growth I've ever seen. They took a Lamborghini and treated it like a lawnmower. That's really what I felt like happened. It broke my heart a million pieces. But something happened with those teenagers. They loved God. That's about all that they had in their life is just love for God. Nothing else. No wisdom. No other stuff. And something started to happen when one of them, like it happened to me, caught fire. And they started to burn. And I remember I was seeing their eyes. And I saw the same thing that I had in mind when I was 16. My only prayer to God was, God, may it not take that long for them <laughs> of 10 or 15 years. And two years spinning wheels. There were more youth on the stage than in the sanctuary. But it did not matter. Because when you catch the fuego, when you catch that, that spark, the most important thing is that parents and the church doesn't become firefighters. Because some deacons in their churches, the moment they see fire, they have a gift to put it out. So I just want to take a stand right now and just defend those teenagers. I understand they lack wisdom, but so did you when you were their age. When we as a church step into the last days, we will not have youth with us. If the prayers we prayed, God answers, and the first thing we do is we put it out. I understand we may not agree of certain things, but it's better to steer a moving car than to steer a parked car without an engine and a transmission. And some of us, we lecture them to death. Instead of once they kindle, kindle a flame. It's easier to begin to navigate and guide and protect the fire. Because my goal is not to build theologians that are 15 year olds. My goal is to make them into burning bushes that I can then help them to know the truth, navigate the stuff. But if I put out the fire, I will have no one to guide me to the pillars, to push the pillars away. And we will end up people who don't have a future, who build the retirement centers out of our churches instead of revival centers. Well, the elders, where the wise men, where the pastors come alongside and they provide the covering, covering the blind spots of these young men, covering the blind spots of these young women. Why? Because we place them in a the place of honor. Why? Because they gave us a place to flourish when all they probably wanted is to put out the fire. Pastors, don't let the board kill the future of the church. Don't let that controlling board member who has a spirit of Jezebel ruin your future. I'll rather lose a board member than young people. I'll rather lose some one family always complains why do you allow young people? Why do you allow this? But they made this. Our young people make the most mess in the church physically. More mess. Carpets are stained with the carpet. We fuss with them all the time. But we have to allow to work with that. Why? Because I'll rather fight over a carpet that got stained because 10 kids brought Red Bull and nine of them got delivered. And have no stained carpets, no Red Bull, no life and no revival. What happened in Asbury Revival 
I believe is just the beginning. I believe something is brewing. Amazing how many Facebook theologians came out, not from God. And that's fine. Watch me. Well, watch, watch this. Those places who have that kind of view, where anytime God sparks with the youth and we always put it out, they are on the clock. It will expire. We as church, I am not saying that we allow weirdness and sin. I'm talking about we kindle the flame and when we see the flame, we protect it. We guard that. We speak life into that. If kids went to a camp and somebody got delivered, that shouldn't be a discussion in the board meeting. That should be a celebration. If three kids finally got repented from a homosexuality, that should be a praise report. Not a membership meeting where we begin to kick people out. We got to protect the flame. We got to grab the lads and walk with the lads into the revival that God has for us. Can somebody say amen? Are you ready for number no i love it you guys keep record number nine samson had the greatest victory at the end of his life i believe this is my prophetic word i believe i see it in the scripture that god is bringing the greatest revival in the last days i believe one of the sparks of that revival will be one of the tools that will spark the revival faster than in any generation before it will be media because whereas before revival would take five years to reach china and australia today it will take five hours when the revival breaks out in a university in five hours that godless demonic TikTok can still be a tool because david used the goliath sword to cut off goliath's head and I believe God will even use the tools like TikTok to begin to viral revival faster so that kids can get kindled, kids get sparked around the world. I believe we are set up for such a time as this to see the greatest move of God where we will see the darkness getting darker and the light of God will rise and shine upon the church and this gospel shall be preached to the ends of the earth and then the end shall come. We are now waiting for the antichrist we are now waiting for the european union and the one global world currency we are waiting for the revival we are preparing for the revival we are fanning little flames in our churches we are guarding little flames in our communities and when we see god bringing revival in your church instead of making a video against it we will go there and fan the flame and say brother pray for me so i can catch that flame and when you see revival in our church instead of spitting out and say Lord send it our way Lord send it our way because the last days for God in the church God will do revival we are that generation we stand on the shoulders of the generals of God on the shoulders of Azusa Street on the shoulders of Martin Luther but somehow for our time God chose us somehow for this hour he chose you. What will your mark be on your generation? What will you burn for? What will you fight for? What will you lay your life for? What will you tell your grandchildren that you did with your life for God? My great-grandpa sat in jail for 10 years for preaching the gospel. After he was released from preaching the gospel, the communists were riding in the village and him and his best friend were walking away from the village and the communist told him to jump on their little horse cart wagon wagon horse cart wagon they jumped on that thing and they had no choice because they knew that they would get shot if they don't because when communists would invite you if you reject it you're dead this is their invitation and they jumped on it as they sat there these communists who locked them in jail started to physically beat him. And my great-grandfather's best friend realized this is not going to be good. So he quickly jumped and ran. My great-grandfather wanted to jump too. But as he was about to jump, his leg got stuck in the cart. So his body went out and his leg got trapped. 
and they instead of stopping the horses they drove them faster and my grand grandfather's body was beating the ground for 40 minutes while the two communist guys were beating him more he suffered irreversible brain damage he was taken to the hospital he never recovered from that and he died that's how he lived that's the generation God chose to put him in but God placed me in my generation what will be my story what will be your story I want to challenge you that while we have freedom while you know the Holy Spirit's power that you don't live a mediocre complacent Christian life that you burn for God and spark others to burn for God I want to challenge you to set yourself up for God I want to challenge you to consecrate yourself and God might not use you like he used the students at Asbury but he might use you to lead three people to Jesus that's already a fire in school he might lead you to lead your family to Jesus that's a fire in your family tree he might lead you to lead your three co-workers to Jesus and that's a fire in that factory he may lead you to start a business and you will start evangelizing. Each one of our, us will have a flame that's different. But one thing, it has to give light to Jesus. It has to reach our generation and it has to penetrate darkness all the time. Let's be a revival a generation. And the last thing that I want to end with is not only that the revival is coming, but Samson lost his life in the victory. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is this, we have to pay the price with our life and if time comes that we need to die for Christ, we need to make up our mind today to die for Him. I believe you cannot live for Jesus until you choose today to die for Him. The only way to live for Jesus is to be ready to die for Him any moment. Unfortunately, the American Christianity, our Christianity, the one that we live in, has taught many of us how to be successful. Very few of us know how to suffer. The Bible says to endure suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I am not against success, I'm not against material things, I'm not against money, I'm not against wealth, that has its place. But as a Christian, the core of what burns inside of you has to be to carry the cross. The new age says discover yourself, Christianity says deny yourself. The message of the cross is I come to Jesus because He died for me and then I accept Jesus, I get on the cross and I die for Him. It's no longer I but Christ who lives in me. I've been crucified with Christ. The moment you die to your ego and to your pride and you're willing to die for Jesus, you're unstoppable. No persecution will take you out and some hate comment on YouTube and on Facebook or on Google ads, it's not going to throw you off. Why? Because you're a dead man walking because your life has been laid on the altar, because your life has been already surrendered. Not 90%, not 50%, but 100% for Jesus Christ. I believe the price for revival is a total consecration. I'm not saying we have to give all of our money, though sometimes God may lead us. I'm not saying we have to give all of our time that we pray and fast, but that we give our whole life at the altar. And from that place, we enjoy our family. From that place, we enjoy our vacations. And from that place, we enjoy material things from a place that we are dead. A lot of us are afraid to lose our life. A lot of people are afraid to speak up for Christ. And why? Because they're still alive. If persecution comes, and I do believe as the revival accelerates, it will attract persecution and many believers are snowflakes they're so beautiful they're so cute but they don't last when the heat comes when the persecution comes they melt away they're no longer a church they're no longer reading the word they're no longer serving and I want to challenge you today to die not to live if you found life in Jesus, you can find deeper life through death. And I'm not saying martyr, martyrdom Christianity. I'm talking about a Christianity where you can truly live because you died. 
you can truly experience fulfillment because you died revival cannot be handled by people who are not dead because revival gives exposure many of us will feed our ego it will throw our calendar like out of whack it will be crazy revival puts a lot of pressure on us and when we are not careful and we are not dead and regularly dying to our ego it can destroy us but if we are dead and we're dead men walking and God can do whatever he wants to do with and through us and if he chooses to put us aside and said I don't want to involve you in this next thing we will be like John the Baptist who said it is my joy that I decrease he increases but when you are like King Saul who's not dead and David is increasing you're not joyful you're jealous and you want to kill him but when you're like John the Baptist and you're dead to your ego and you said Lord whatever you're doing in this season don't do it without me but if you choose to do it without me count on me to support that movement support that generation cheer that on like John the Baptist this he said may he increase and I decrease I want to challenge each and every one of you today to die many of your problems will be over think about how much problems physically will be solved if you died all of them all of your problems will be gone and that lawsuit that will be over the mortgage that's solved your problem with your kidneys and that's gone your children everything all of your problems will be over many many and this is not exaggerating unless a grain seed falls into the ground and dies it will remain one but if it dies it will not remain one it will come as a forest when God beckons you to die it's not because he wants your funeral because he wants to farm you into a forest but he can't do that until you follow the cross what that cross did to his son it has to do its perfect work in me and you you're like I'm a son I'm not gonna die well guess who died on the cross it was a son we're gonna have to embrace suffering not run from it not be afraid of it and the cost that will come following Jesus Christ we will take that on and if it comes jail if it comes death and if it comes little petty persecutions little petty misunderstandings or criticisms or bloggers or somebody spreading rumors we say man bring that on we're not talking about proper critique or coaching we're talking about naysayers haters and all of the all of the stuff God wants us to die.